Welcome to WG University, Weber Gallagher's Series of Educational Programs. This is our Workers' Compensation Webinar Series. I am David Green, and I am presenting from our Philadelphia office. Each month, we present a current topic in workers' compensation legal issues. We present both case updates and ways to manage risk in your businesses. If you would like to view this webinar again, share it with others, or see our WG University programs, please visit the Weber Gallagher website, uh, www.wglaw.com, and you will find copies of this presentation and others under the WG University page. Today's presentation, and one that is very near and dear to my heart, is how to partner with your attorney to lower your workers' compensation costs. Next month, our topic will be defending motions for med and temp. That's a New Jersey presentation. If you have questions during this presentation, you can email them to questions at wglaw.com. We will do our best to answer your questions during the webinar, um, and any questions that we don't get to, I will personally respond to by email as soon as I can after the presentation. So let's get started. All right, like I said, um, how to partner with your workers' compensation attorney is something that is very near and dear to my heart, but before we even start talking about how to partner with your workers' compensation attorney, you need to talk about things that you need to do just to get started in the investigatory process. I hear clients come to me all the time and say, we can't win in Pennsylvania, we've got no chance, the cards are stacked against us, there's just nothing we can do. And what I'm here to tell you is, um, that's just not true. Um, and whether your business's policy is try cases to decision, um, push them towards settlement, um, whatever it may be, I'm hopeful that some of the things that I'm going to talk about today are things that you'll really be able to utilize in your business to manage your workers' compensation costs better. So the first thing we need to talk about is what needs to be done before you ever get a claim. Because as I'm going to say over and over again, and I'm sorry if I'm going to be repetitive, but it's important, facts always not always, 95% of the time outweigh the medical. And if your facts are lined up properly and you impeach claimant's credibility, that's the way you win cases in Pennsylvania. So we're, we're going to talk about pre-injury documentation. So things like attendance issues, disciplinary issues, um, written warnings. Why do I have on the PowerPoint written warnings? Because I can't tell you how many times I'll get a new case in and I'll speak to the employer and they'll say, oh my goodness, this employee was such a bad employee. He was always late. He had all of these issues. And I say, great, send me the personnel file. And they'll say, well, we didn't really document everything in the personnel file. Now that's okay, you can still have a witness come in, but the written personnel file and documentation concerning written warnings are so much more effective when it comes to litigation. And just because of HIPAA reasons, keep your personnel file and workers' compensation file separate. Okay. <clears throat> um, the employee handbook. Why should you have an employee handbook? Well, there are things, for example, like if you have a drug policy that is a no questions asked person is fired if they test positive for drugs. And if you, through your panel physicians, ha through your panel occupational health physicians, have mandatory drug testing following the reporting of an accident, well, even if the accident itself is compensable, because only under very limited circumstances can you deny um, an injury based on intoxication or things like that, um, if you would have had light duty work available but can't offer it because the employee fails a fails a drug test, then maybe you're paying some medical, but you're denying wage loss, which can, which can also be an important way to manage claims. Um, so now let's talk about post-injury. So you, you get notice of an injury or an alleged injury, and hopefully you have all of that documentation that I already talked about, assuming there is um, um, important stuff now in your personnel file. And now the question is, what should we do? Um, first thing is a signed statement from the worker. 
Why is that so important? Well, it's unbelievable how stories can change once the employee gets to um, a doctor of his or her own choosing or even more specifically to his or her attorney. Um, so if you get a signed statement from the worker indicating that, look, I just injured my low back, that's it, then it's going to be a lot easier to challenge the neck and the knee when those things are brought into play later on. Um, make sure that that the employee treats with a panel doctor. Um, it's a totally different seminar, how to manage um, your panel physicians and making sure the employee signs the rights and responsibilities form, um, both at the time of hire and at the time of injury or alleged injury, which allows you to maintain that 90 days of control. And if you have questions on that, please, please email me. But here's where I start, th start saying again, facts are greater than, than medical. So some of the facts to gather, and maybe you can make this part of the employee statement. How did the injury occur exactly? What body parts were injured? Were there any witnesses? I recently had a case up in the Allentown area where the employee was a Spanish-speaking individual, and this particular company has a very detailed form that they utilize when an individual claims an injury. And this person was given a Spanish um, Spanish translator and was asked to, to, and this form was actually in Spanish. They have one in English and one in Spanish, and the employee was asked to write exactly how the injury occurred in as much detail as possible. And it's amazing how very brief and undetailed the employee was when the employee filled out this initial form and how unbelievably specific this employee got when this employee testified in front of the judge. And we were able to use the original statement to impeach the employee's credibility during litigation. Past medical history, family doctor. Family doctor is really important. Why? Because oftentimes when that petition's filed, um, we don't have that information to subpoena right away. Well, if that information is obtained in conjunction with the initial reporting of the accident, then perhaps we can start getting information about the past medical history. And typically information from the family doctor is most crucial in identifying what was going on in this person's, in this person's past. Okay, so in summary, um, signed statement, you already have the employee statement, a signed statement from any witnesses, a signed statement from a supervisor. Typically, the best thing to do is to interview people right away, and then look, maybe if the statement isn't helpful, you can make a decision as to whether or not you want to commit that to writing or not. Um, the supervisor statement, for better or worse, should always be taken and should always be in writing, and you can deal with that. But when you interview coworkers, and potential witnesses, you can make a decision as to whether you want to commit them to writing or not. Now, why is it so important to do all of this? Well, um, I indicate here um, it's important even if the injury is compensable because you're managing the law. And if you've been in this business for a while, and I saw some of the names on this sign-up sheet, and I know some people have, you know and you've had situations where small claims, which turn out to be just medical-only claims and seem like nothing, can turn into major headaches later on. And the more you can do to document things in the initial aspect of the case, the better you can use that information to manage um, the risk later on. Um, I also indicate you want to preserve the equipment. Um, if you don't preserve equipment that potentially um, is faulty, you might lose the opportunity for subrogation in a third-party case. Not that you lose your subrogation right, but if the employee can't prove that third-party case, then you wouldn't have a mode of recovery through subrogation. All right. Um, once you have all the information together, I wanted to explain two recent cases that I dealt with where what I was dealing with with my client was, do the allegations really make sense? The first one, a heart attack following a delivery, was a case where it was a guy who um, was in like an armored style truck and he and his partner would um, take money in envelopes from a location and go to different kiosks and fill money and um, 
take take money out, fill envelopes. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so um, one guy was the driver and one guy was the runner, and they would trade off depending upon the particular day. So in this particular day, the claimant was the runner. The other guy, his partner, was the driver. And the claimant story is he's running into a place in – um, I think it was in Lancaster County. He lived in the Philadelphia area. And as soon as he got to that ATM kiosk, I think it was inside a CVS, um, he said he started to feel short of breath and started to sweat. And because he's dealing with money, he was very emotional and, and he got stressed. So he did his job as fast as he could and he ran back to the truck as fast as he could. And the next thing he knew, he woke up in the hospital. And this was a very, very bad case because the guy was about 49 years old, if I recall correctly, and um, he was completely disabled as a result of his heart condition, multiple catheterizations and things like that. And he was basically told they didn't even want him learning a new job again because of the stress that was going to put on his weakened heart. And... What we went, we went through thousands of pages of medical records from the hospital. And in those thousands of pages of medical records, there was one very interesting piece of paper. And it, on, on that one very interesting piece of paper was a summary of the discussion that this guy's partner had with the hospital staff. And what this guy's partner said to the hospital staff was that, I forget the guy's first name, it doesn't matter. Um, this guy came back into the truck. Everything seemed fine. We were laughing and joking around. And the next thing I knew, the guy was passed out. And thank goodness we got him to the pocket defibrillator, which apparently saved the guy's life. The second thing we found out was that this guy had been in a motor vehicle accident two months before and claimed when he testified that he went back to his family doctor and his family doctor had cleared him of um, I guess he had some high blood pressure when he went to the family doctor, but the family doctor had cleared him and everything was fine. We obtained the subpoenaed records, and lo and behold, what did they show? They showed that he didn't even visit this family doctor. But we didn't present the family doctor. What we did was we submitted those records to show that in the absence um, of any visit, that this was a prior inconsistent statement, so an exception to the hearsay rule. In any event, that's the sort of intense investigation that's necessary sometimes to defeat a claim, and we won. And the demand was, I believe, somewhere north of $250,000, and my client had authorized about $100,000 to settle. Claimant didn't want it. Claimant lost. Um, the pothole incident is a very, very recent case that I handled, and the pothole incident was one where the claimant, his attorney, focused exclusively on the fact that the, that the claimant was in a truck, and hit a pothole and went to the emergency room afterwards. And what my client and I focused on was that when this guy, um, 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 when he was driving his truck and his truck hit the pothole, um, he called his supervisor, his dispatcher, and he said, yeah, I'm getting that dizzy feeling that I was feeling before the injury. Well, the guy goes to the hospital, he's complaining of all of these things, but the, the claimant's attorney really focused on just the fact that he was in an incident. And when you looked at the totality of circumstances, what you found was there was an incident, but there was no injury. And I see this all the time. People forget that just because there's an incident doesn't mean there's an injury. Um, I've been in four car accidents in my life, and fortunately, I'm knocking on wood because you can't see, I've never been injured. Well, just because you have an incident doesn't mean that you suffer an injury, and that needs to be something that's investigated in every case. Another case where the demand was in excess of 200000 my client was willing to offer fifty, um, and claimant didn't take it, and claimant got nothing. Okay. When you get into litigation, and this is something that's very, very important to me, who's in charge of the case? And it's a very simple answer. The answer is nobody. In order, if you want to win a Pennsylvania workers' compensation case, or if you just want to manage it in such a way that you can settle it for the lowest possible number, 
The key is that everyone has to work together. It is almost impossible. It, it can happen. So a client sends me a case and they really don't help me. And all I do is I use what I have and I can't contact anyone. I, I might get lucky once in a while. But nine times out of ten, without the participation of the employer to get me all the information that we're talking about, and without the participating of the adjuster who's sort of you know, managing all the different entities, including surveillance vendors, nurses, and things like that, I can't win. Um, and I'm, not only can I not win, but I can't do what I need to do to help manage my client's risks in the best way possible. So if you're ever working with me on a case, you know that usually after I get the file in, I want to schedule a conference call. So I want to find out what's going on. And as we'll talk about in a few minutes, cases move so fast today. And especially on a claim petition dealing with credibility, you could have that first listing for claimant's testimony 30 days after the petition is filed. And there's a lot of legwork that needs to be done during those first 30 days or so for your one shot at cross-examining the claimant in front of the of of the judge. That's the key to the case because you can't have the judge write down, I think claimant's credible at that initial hearing and then hope that through your fact witness testimony you can change the judge's mind. You need the judge to be thinking and wondering and waiting and saying, you know what? I don't know what I think right now. I need to wait to see how the evidence presents itself. Presents itself. Okay. Um, before we talk about some specific litigation strategies, um, there are some things where you really want to be careful um, in the acceptance of the claim process. Um, and that's really when you have legal issues and whether it's me or anyone else at our firm, we're always happy to give free legal advice to help put you in the right direction before a case actually goes into litigation. So thing, any of these, these lists, these things listed are all affirmative defenses, violation of law, violation of positive work order. Um, just by, by way of brief example, violation of law is an example if the intoxication caused the injury, that's a defense. Violation of positive work order, if the employee breaks a rule, that's not just a safety rule, but something the person um, shouldn't have been doing, um, wasn't part of his or her job duties and gets injured. Um, parking lot cases are very fact specific. There is a case on the books where an employee was injured in a Mellon Bank parking lot in the western Pennsylvania area, and the employee worked for Mellon Bank. And that claim was deemed not compensable. Why? Because that parking lot was not exclusive to the employee or to the employees, and technically it wasn't integral to the business of Mellon Bank. Um, and of course, mental, mental claims because of the high um, burden of proof. Um, there are certain instances where mental, mental claims are clearly compensable, um, but they are very few. And as I indicate here, conference calls, Shared correspondence and information are key to the best outcome. And I really think conference calls are crucial because as much as we all rely on electronic communication and as much as we share information quickly with emails, there's just something about a conference call when you're actually speaking, even if it's just ov over the phone, um, you tend to get more information back and forth and among the different parties involved than you would if you just had an email communication back and forth. And I don't mean to say that's important in every situation, in every case, or in every circumstance in every case, but it's, it's extremely important in terms of the initial strategizing to get the attorney ready for that first and crucial hearing when the claimant's going to testify. All right, now let's talk about litigation strategy. <clears throat> As we discussed, all facts must be fully investigated before testimony. And this is something that I don't know why more people do it. I can't explain why more people don't do it. Those of you who work with me know that I always recommend it if the employer is willing to do this. And that is have the supervisor attend the first hearing with me 
when the employee is going to testify. Now, why would you have that supervisor present when the employee is going to testify if that supervisor is not going to testify at that first hearing? And guess what? We don't want the supervisor to testify at that first hearing. We want to give the supervisor an opportunity to review claimant's complete testimony that occurred at the first hearing. But why do you want the supervisor present? One, you know, everyone knows that the tie goes to the runner or the tie goes to the claimant employee in a workers' compensation case. So if the scales aren't tipped in either party's favor and they're even, the claimant's going to win every time. By having the supervisor there at the first hearing, you begin to have your client build a relationship with the judge. It's extremely important. The second thing is, and I've seen it happen, having a supervisor present can influence the claimant's testimony. The best example I can give of this was a case that I handled in Allentown, and when the claimant was, and I had two supervisors with me because the employee alleged two separate injuries and there were two separate injury dates and two separate supervisors. Excuse me. And when the claimant was testifying pursuant to his own attorney's questions, the claimant looked the attorney in the eye. When I started cross-examining the claimant, the claimant looked down and kept his head down almost the entire time during the testimony. I had never seen that before. I'm sure the judge took notice. This was a case where our evaluating physician found that the claimant had multiple physical problems and that his surgeries were not work, and that his surgeries were work-related if the history the claimant gave and the testimony the claimant gave was accurate and true. And we were able to show the judge that the claimant was a complete liar, that everything the claimant said was false, and I am absolutely positive that having the supervisors present and making this claimant uncomfortable at that first hearing played a role. That doesn't happen very often. What does happen often is number three here, and that is that I am allowed, after the claimant's direct testimony, to say to the judge, Judge, excuse me, but I need two minutes to speak to my client outside. Why is that important? It's important because no matter how much we have discussed the case, no matter how much you have prepared me, no matter how many conference calls we have had, no matter how much information you've provided me, no matter how much the personnel file is documented, something can come up during that testimony that we have not anticipated. And the only way, during my one shot at cross-examining the claimant, that I have the opportunity to know what the real deal is, is if I speak to the supervisor in between direct and cross. And this happened to me where I had a claimant who said, I was injured on Friday, and my client was telling me, this guy said nothing on Friday. The first thing he said was on Monday as soon as he came in. We know this happened over the weekend, and there was this supervisor and that supervisor, and everyone knew that he never said anything on Friday. And claimant comes into hearing, and claimant testifies, and he said, I told Billy on Friday about this. Billy is my second foreman. I forget the circumstances of the case. I turned to the person with me, and I said, I wrote down a piece of paper, who's Billy? Anyway, in between direct and cross, we went outside, and my client who was with me called Billy. And we spoke to Billy, and Billy said, this person said nothing to me on Friday, so what was I able to do during cross? Sir, you said you spoke to Billy about this on Friday. What time of day did you speak to Billy? Where were you when you spoke to Billy? What did Billy do when you spoke to him? Now, if I didn't know what my supervisor or my foreman, Billy, was going to say, I would have been very concerned about asking those questions. But because I knew what Billy was going to say, I set this guy up, and Billy came in and totally refuted everything that the claimant was going to say, or that the claimant did say. Okay. 
<clears throat> here we go again, the facts greater than medical. Does everyone understand what I mean when I say facts are greater than medical? If you have a case where you are just saying, my doctor is better than your doctor, prepare to lose. That is not the way you win cases in Pennsylvania. You need to understand the theory. You need to be able to explain to the judge why the claimant should be found to be not credible. And if you can't tell the judge why the claimant should be found not credible, then you are most likely going to lose the case. But if you have the theory and you know the theory and you use the litigation to develop this theory throughout everything that you're doing, through your cross-examination of the claimant, through the presentation of your witness or witnesses, through your cross-examination of the doctor. The cross-examination of the doctor isn't typically about whether the straight leg raising test was positive or negative. It's about what the history was and what the complaints were and whether or not that's consistent with what claimant testified to or what he told everybody. <clears throat> and whether, and like I said, excuse me, whether you're using that for purposes of winning the case or taking the case or, um, or settling the case, these are the types of things that allow you to minimize exposure because you want the claimant to be fearful that the claimant is going to lose. If, if the claimant's not fearful that he or she's going to lose, then you have no leverage. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about a claim petition, although that's generally what we're talking about here, a reinstatement petition, a termination petition, suspension or modification petition, I don't care. You need to know what your theory is and you need to develop it. And the only way to do that is through factual investigation, not because your IME doctor says full recovery. If that's all you got, okay, that's all you got. You'll hear from me or any other attorney in, in this office that's a case that we should be looking to settle because it's not worth it to litigate this case until the end because unless we find a smoking gun somewhere, we're going to lose. <clears throat> okay, this is just repetitive. We talked about both of, of, of those things. Okay, this is really important. Settlement strategy. Every judge, or most judges, and most claimants attorneys are going to evaluate a case, evaluate a case the same way. Three to four years of TTD. Don't buy into that nonsense. You need your attorney to provide you with an evaluation of what your exposure is, can, and should be under the facts of this case and given all the information that you have in this case. If it turns out that that's a three to four year range, well then so be it. But that cannot be the norm, and that cannot be how generally a case is evaluated. All that is, is under the mediation platform that we're working on, the judges try to push that oftentimes because it's a quick way to dispose of cases. And because of the way the judges deal with things, that is what claimants' attorneys tell their clients. That is not the job of your attorney, and that is not the way any case should be evaluated, although that information can be used as sort of a backdrop because of the way claimants, attorneys, and judges like to evaluate cases. All right. That's the litigation strategy. There's some other things we can do to manage the exposure, and that's really what we're talking about here, because not everything is litigation, and we know that even though you might use us only for purposes of litigation, and we have clients who use us on the risk management side without litigation, that you're thinking about dollars. You're not thinking about just litigation and litigation of claims. So post-injury reemployment. Um, <clears throat> it's great. Your panel physicians need to be providing you with very detailed physical capacities so you can try to get these folks back to work as soon as possible. If your panel physicians don't have a physical capacity checklist that they're using, give them one and make it the norm in, in every case. Um, the best way, and there have been studies about this, to limit exposure both on the indemnity and on the medical side um, is to bring the employee back to work as soon as possible one way or another. Um, but there are pros and cons to that, right? 
because the person can come back and the person might be someone who you really don't want back and that can cause other problems. The person could come back, it could be a strenuous job, the person could get re-injured again and you're back to where you started. So a lot of, a lot of employers like to limit the temporary alternative work, TAW, to 60 or 90 days. The downside of that is if that's your policy and the person doesn't return, then you only have a 60 day to 90 day window of relief through litigation, which really isn't going to help you. But that's a business decision and th th there are pros and cons um, in that. You need to make sure that when someone is back to work in a modified duty capacity, that the supervisor really understands what those limitations are um, and documents any sort of issues or problems that occur during the return to work process. <clears throat> and it's just, it's um, this, this right here, this is a proven theory that the longer the employee is, is out, the longer he or she stays out. That may sound silly, but it just means that there is an exponential graph, which as a person stays out, you are just less likely to get that person back for a whole host um, of, of reasons. And we've talked about these things. The one thing we didn't talk about is consider a fitness for duty examination. Um, some employers, when they're bringing someone back to work, um, they have you know, through their uh, health department um, at their panel have a specific fitness for duty examination in addition to the IME or the panel physician's relief. Okay, um, last but not least, managing the manager. Why is this important? Well, at the very beginning, we talked about how important it is to document the personnel file, how important we talked about later on about when a person returns to temporary alternative work or just a light duty job in general, how important it is for the supervisor to document things. Well, if the supervisor doesn't understand what his or her role is, how do you expect the partnership between the attorney, the claims representative, and the employer to work for you to manage your workers' compensation costs. You can't. So the supervisors need to know what's going on and they need to be apprised of some of these things that I'm talking about today. Um, safety meetings, very important. Uh, we see tons of injuries where um, people broke safety rules. That is a compensable claim. Um, whether you have safety meetings or not, you're always gonna have people who do <coughs> things they shouldn't do. Um, but having safety meetings help. Um, and communication with employees and an open door policy. If you're a supervisor, if you're like in a manufacturing plant and your supervisor is has an office that's on the side of the floor, but the supervisor keeps his door closed and doesn't interact with the employees on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you're not gonna get the information that you would if the supervisor is really well trained. So, um, that's all the information I have. It's very hard to fit a program like this into a 30 to 40 minute seminar, webinar, whatever you wanna call it. Um, I would encourage you, if you have questions, um, I'm very passionate about the, um, the partnership between the attorney and the employer and about working together to um, deal with managing these costs and managing your risk. And if you ever would like to speak to me about it, um, I'm happy to speak to you. And like I said, I didn't get any, any questions from our team here, but if you have any questions, please feel free to email them to, what was it, to uh, questions at WG Law, and those will be rerouted um, to me. Um, so listen, thank you so much for attending our webinar um, of how to partner with your attorney to lower your workers' compensation costs. Um, and as I um, said earlier about our next program, that's gonna be on December 20th. And like I said, that's from our New Jersey office and it'll be entitled Defending Motions for Med and Temp. Um, our attorneys will, will present the key steps in defending these motions and the best way to limit your costs and exposure um, because motions for med and temp, a lot like some of the initial things that we spoke about, require immediate action and investigation. And of course, you can learn more about this program and all other Weber, Weber Gallagher events at www.wglaw.com forward slash capital W, capital G hyphen university. That's wglaw.com forward slash wg hyphen university. 
Um, thank you for listening to me, and uh, have a very happy Thanksgiving.